Okay, great. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm super excited to, to have everybody join us. I know many of you are in different parts of the world, uh, and some of you have probably never joined one of these um, 1880 talks. So I'm going to give you a little preamble um, before we kick off. There's a reason why we do this, and, and really every effort that we do in a salon talk is, is a means of understanding either who we are and how we relate to other humans or how we relate to the planet that we inhabit. And, and it, it gives us time to pause and reflect on that and see if we want to adjust ourselves. Um, we have two sort of competing, um, um, I think, trends in, in, our, in our approach to life. And one of those is, is a, a necessity to try to master, uh, to, to control the world that we live in. And that can be um, a mastery of our relationships with our family or a mastery of our job or a mastery of, of our personal finance. Um, but we do that and, and can be consumed by the ambition to, to just control it really well. There are other moments when we, when we take time to pause and reflect on the world that we live in. And, and in there, our ambitions tend to be very different and they tend to be um, sort of characterized by wonder and awe and, and maybe love and, and love of the, the planet that we live on and the people that inhabit it with us. And it's this sort of tension between these two things that I think uh, leads us to, to where we are today. Um, what we like to do with 1880 with these salon talks is, is ask you to release your grip on your self-control, um, give up dominion over everything that you try to control, and, and take a minute to pause and reflect uh, and question your values, uh, question your, the status quo, question you know, what conventional wisdom tells you. And, and no better way to do that than by asking really erudite, interesting, fascinating people to join us um, to, so we can learn about their, their journeys and learn about what they get up to. And with that in mind, we've invited four very special people. I, I'm, um, I consider myself very lucky that I can call them all friends. Uh, these uh, four people that are gonna, gonna, we're gonna ask them to introduce themselves in a second, um, have each, I think, taken a path in life that, that um, is something to be massively applauded because they've put other responsibilities, I think, ahead of their own dominion. And, um, and, and so with that in mind, I'd like you all to sort of help me uh, welcome uh, Sabrina, Josh, John, and Paul, I'm going to ask each of you to give a quick introduction. I'd ask you not to be too humble, but also not to be too long-winded. Uh, and uh, we're going to uh, we're going to kick off the conversation with John, um, but we'll do the introductions with Sabrina first. <laughs> so Sabrina, uh, please, and Sabrina and Josh, please, everybody uh, understand that they're joining us from, from very different parts of the world. Sabrina, you're in Missouri, right? Yes, I'm in the okay. middle of the middle. <laughs> okay, so off you go, Sabrina. Please tell us who you are, what you do, uh, and answer one little question for me. Are you an optimist or a pessimist right now? Ah, okay, cool. Well, thanks, Mark. Um, it's a pleasure to be on the panel with everyone uh, here and Seeing folks again from 1880. Um, so for those who don't know me, um, I'm Sabrina. I'm an international lawyer uh, with a background in finance uh, coming from the M&A and private equity world. Um, I lived and worked in a number of countries across five continents, uh, usually based in New York, but of course, my heart is always in Singapore. And in the spirit of full disclosure, we should probably mention that <laughs> I'm married to a, a fellow panelist. Um, it's the fella in the <laughs> stop me. Well, I have some news. <laughs> it's the uh, the fella in the blazer. So uh, yeah, so Paul and I have been together for a, a long time. Uh, hi, honey. <laughs> um, oh, and finally, oh, on the um, professional front, I'm legal director of Dino North America. It's the largest B Corp in the world, and also um, director of our global B Corp community, which we'll talk about uh, later in this discussion. Um, whether I'm optimist or pessimist, I think optimist. Um, it's, uh, I've, had, I've had moments in my life where I was uh, the glass half empty and it was very tough. So it's been a, a journey. Got it. John Wood, joining us from Hong Kong. Yeah, hi, Mark. Hi, everyone. Um, so my brief introduction, uh, I first came to Asia 25 years ago working for Microsoft. Uh, in a marketing role, I ran marketing for Asia Pacific and then later ran business development for the greater China region. Left Microsoft about 21 years ago to start Room to Read, 
uh, which has now impacted 20 million students in 20 low income countries in 40,000 communities. So we've had a good run. Uh, and one of the major ways, we've actually at Room to Read raised about $650 million, which for philanthropic wow. capital, that's really hard to do that heavy of a lift. And one of the main ways we did it was by finding a way to not pitch corporations to fund us out of their charity budget, but to do purpose-driven partnerships that were win-win for the company and win-win for Room to Read. Uh, and I know we're gonna talk more about that. So that's just a little bit of a preview. Uh, in addition to Room to Read, I'm uh, on the board of Asia Partners, an investor in Asia Partners, a private equity firm that's uh, about to do our first close, or sorry, our final close on our first fund uh, in the next week. Uh, and I'm an investor in both Green Monday and a billion and a senior advisor to both companies. Fantastic, thanks for being with us, John. Paul? Uh, it's great to go after John on a panel. I mean, I've been inspired by John's journey with Room to Read for you know, way well over a decade. I'm a Canadian like Mark. I was born in Whistler in the west coast of Canada, uh, made my way via New York City and a time in corporate law on Wall Street out to Asia 13 years ago. Um, the past 10 years of my life have been in the bar and spirits industry. You know, we opened a cocktail bar here in Singapore 10 years ago. Um, what was meant to be a sabbatical project turned into an entire career. Um, so my background is drinks, spirits, great bars. Um, we, fun fact, we have four of the world's 50 best bars in the last year. So if you look at the world rankings, quite a, a unique thing. And so we get a chance to work with really cool bars. Um, and that has led me to uh, EcoSpirits, which is the first closed loop spirits distribution technology in the world. I'm a big, big believer in the circular economy as a big part of our future. Uh, and going back to my roots in the Pacific Northwest and the environmental movement that was so important back then, it's great to be able to, in our industry, in spirits and bar industry, begin to have an impact with, with something like EcoSpirits. Perfect. Looking forward to learning a lot more about EcoSpirits in, in a couple of minutes. Josh Shetrick, you're, you're in Hawaii. Welcome. Uh, it's great to have you, Josh. Thanks for, thanks for joining us at, at this late hour for you. Now, it's good to be here. Not just Hawaii, Mark, the oldest island, Kauai. It's about about five million years old. Uh, so it's a, it's a pleasure to, to see everyone. Um, I, I started a food technology company called Eat Just, and we challenge um, a very commonly accepted assumption um, in the food system. Uh, and that assumption is in order to eat an animal, you need to kill an animal. In order to eat chicken, in order to eat a hamburger, in order to have steak, you need to direct bulldozers to knock down trees. In order to enjoy meat with friends and family for dinner, you need to use a whole bunch of antibiotics and do things to the planet and, and act in a way that doesn't align with who we are. Um, we think that's a wrong assumption. Uh, we think the world can eat plenty of meat, but just without the current process. And um, we, we launched a product called Good Meat um, that utilizes a technology that you might have uh, read about called cellular agriculture or culture meat, or as the press refers to it, sometimes lab-grown meat. Uh, but whatever you call it, we think it's the way the, world, the world's going to be eating meat in the decades ahead. Um, we were really fortunate to receive the very first clearance to sell a product of that sort. Um, when Singapore approved it on Thanksgiving night um, uh, last year, uh, and even more fortunate that we had the chance to partner with Mark and the 1880 team uh, to do something that people have been talking about for 100 years, but we figured out a way to do, which is sit a bunch of good people down for a dinner, have good conversations, and eat real meat without all the issues that typically comes with it. Um, and we did that on December 19th when a group of four young people sat down between 12 and 19 years old um, and believed that there could be a different vision for how we eat meat. Uh, and uh, I'm definitely an optimist, uh, but an optimist who believes that um, you got to put your head down and grind uh, and deal with a lot of things that come up. Uh, but uh, we, we have a lot to be excited about uh, in the next uh, decades ahead, but it's going to take a lot of work. Um, Josh, what I was saying is I was glad that you brought up young people because the, the first part of the conversation I'd like to tackle is really where we are culturally and, and what shifts are underway. And I want to start this with John because, John, three years ago when you and I met uh, in the Four Seasons Bar, actually, um, you were uh, just completing and about to launch uh, a book called um, Purpose Incorporated. 
And I would love for you to tell us a little bit about why you wrote that book, but also what you've observed in the three years since then, because you've, you've attracted the attention of business leaders, of, of business students. Um, a lot of people are celebrating your book and, and maybe living by its principles. So if you could share a little bit about that, that'd be helpful. Sure, I conveniently have a copy right here, just to, uh, just to wait, I know Sabrina has a copy <laughs> of her too. Do you just showing me. So, the, you know, what's interesting about the book, I think, is the subtitle, uh, which if you can read, maybe you can't read it, but it's Purpose Incorporated as a title. The subtitle is Turning Cause into Your Competitive Advantage. And the reason I wrote the book was because I really got tired of all the business leaders who bought into this notion propagated originally by Milton Friedman, where, quote unquote, everybody can probably finish the sentence for me, there, there is no social purpose of business besides returning maximum profits to shareholders. And everybody quoted Friedman for decades and decades. But at the same time, there were a lot of business leaders who refused to believe that purpose and profit were antithetical notions. So just as what Paul is doing, what Josh is doing, what people like Elon Musk were doing, we're saying you can have both. You can have purpose while still having profits. You can use purpose as a competitive advantage. These days, very few really enlightened, bright young people want to go to work for ExxonMobil because ExxonMobil spent decades and tens of millions of dollars denying climate change. Um, they want to go to work for the sales forces of the world because Mark Benioff early on embraced the whole notion of pledge 1%. And I wrote the book because I just felt like what was happening was there was this dichotomy where the older generation thought that purpose and profits could not go hand in hand. The younger generation thought not only that it could, but that it should, but the older generation had all the capital and had all the decision-making power. So the idea behind this book was very simple. It was to basically nail the proclamation of the church door to say, if you believe purpose and profits cannot coexist simultaneously, you will lose the war for talent, especially with young people. You'll have a bunch of unmotivated clock punchers who don't come to work every day looking for a greater good. Uh, you won't really have good long-term returns because over time, and if, since I wrote the book, if you chart, just as an example, ExxonMobil share price over the last three years, they just announced a couple of weeks ago, a $22 billion loss. Compare that against Tesla. That's just one test case. Look at Atlassian, look at Salesforce, look at the software companies who actually care about making the world a better place. They're winning the war for talent. So that was basically the idea behind the book. Convince people that purpose and profits are not antithetical notions. You can have both, you should have both. And if you don't go, if you don't go for both at the same time, then you've lost a pretty magical opportunity. Okay, yeah, that's a great segue. Sabrina, your company uh, is largest B Corp certified company. Is that correct? Yes, our uh, US Sabrina, businesses. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, uh, can you, I can hear you perfectly uh, like you're in the room right beside us. Um, you you were, I guess, the, the lead lawyer on that process. You you handled a lot of the, the um, let's say the initial stage of becoming certified. Can you tell us what it means to Danon to be a B Corp certified company and why you guys did it? Yeah. Um, I think building on John's point, um, this is, it's been a movement for a while, right? And, and B Corp has given us this new language or terminology to better understand what this movement or this acceleration of a cultural shift is all about. So for Danone, um, the B Corp principles have always been embedded in our, in our company, um, but our journey started about five years ago. Uh, with the certification of um, actually 30 subsidiaries around the world, uh, including our U.S. business, which is the largest B Corp um, at about uh, $6 billion of revenue. So uh, for us, um, it means uh, a few things because it's, uh, it was a way for us to, sh to remove ourselves from the noise of um, competing companies that have internal ESG CSR programs. Um, that weren't verified, that weren't transparent, um, that had no legal underpinning. So after a lot of uh, discussions with the B Corp community, the founders of B Lab, who come from the M&A financial private equity world, um, we decided that it was the best path for us as a company to enshrine this competitive advantage that John had mentioned earlier. 
Um, we can go deeper into those three prongs that really distinguish B Corp as a trust mark uh, on verification, transparency, and legal accountability. But those are the reasons why uh, Danone decided to uh, invest so much resources into this movement. So you mentioned B Lab. Um, the founder of B Lab, um, J. Cohen Gilbert, said we need to correct an error in the source code of capitalism, shareholder primacy. Um, Josh, I, I want to turn to you for a second, and, and there, there are so many questions that I have for you, but my first question is, 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 is there a, a glitch in the, in the code of, of capitalism? There's, there's definitely a glitch in the code. You know, I, um, I think about capitalism, Mark, is a, as a, is a system. It's a set of processes, incentives to get people to do certain things. And often those things end up being um, destructive to nature. They end up being antithetical to our values. Uh, they end up spreading disinformation. But that same system, that same set of processes um, can be used to make all that better, to invent new things that could feed people, to to do things we all believe in. And I, um, I didn't get that we could look at capitalism with that point of view, that second point of view, um, until I, I read a book called Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid by this guy named C.K. Prahlad when I was in my, my late 20s. I'm 40 now. Um, and the book talked about if you really want to solve the world's most urgent problems, use this tool called capitalism and what it requires more than anything, more than a change in regulatory policy, it requires getting it. It requires that intention. It requires understanding that if you want to solve these problems, you don't just have to reach for a nonprofit or an international organization that you can utilize a system called capitalism. So I think the source of the glitch is our mentality, right? The source of the glitch is the assumption that we're making about what the system is. Um, it is a system and it can be used for things that we believe in. It can be used for things that we don't believe in. And it's and it's up, it's up to us to decide how we how we apply it. Um, and again, I didn't. It seems obvious to me. I didn't get it until my late twenties. Um, and I still think, uh, even though we might think that the majority of young people get that, I spoke to a large group at the University of Michigan a, a few days ago, a group of uh, entrepreneurial students. Unfortunately, I, if I if I had to look at the data three, five, ten years out, I bet you eighty percent of them will end up pursuing careers that are not utilizing capitalism to solve really the world's most urgent problems. And there's a lot of, there are a lot of voices, there are a lot of um, habits, there are a lot of paths that make it a little bit easier for you to choose, quote, the traditional road. Who comes to campus? What your friends are doing? What grandma says, right? Um, and you got to figure out a way to resist all that and realize, I think what what John and, and Sabrina said is there is a way that you can figure out a way to be prosperous personally. But do it in a way that's actually attacking things that matter, not things that you just conjure up and pretend matter, because there's a big difference between the two. So I, I grew up in a time when when I suppose we celebrated the masters of the universe and uh, liars poker and Gordon Gecko and um, and 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 business school. You know, when we looked at the value of a company, we would just take the hard assets, put a number on it, forecast the revenues five years ahead of what you could generate out of those hard assets, bring it back to today's dollar and see if it was a plus or a minus. And today. We talk about businesses being um, the value of a business being a lot more than just that. And um, Paul, I want to throw this at you because I, I know you're you're uh, um, an MBA guy and and a and a business person at, at the core. But yet you chose to um, to to you know as you explained in your introduction, you started a bar, but then you chose to take on. You were doing extremely well uh, in your business, and it was growing throughout Asia, and you had every reason to to be very proud of that and, and rest on it, but you chose to take on a, a very old industry in a very stable, very mature state uh, and try to disrupt it. And, and I mean, in a way, what gives you the right, but, but more importantly, what was it that, that I, I suppose led you to believe that you could, you could actually pull it off? And Josh, you're getting the same question in a minute. <laughs> It's a, Mark, it's a great question. I think what John charted in his book 
and sort of laid out a roadmap there. And what the B Corp movement has been working on for more than a decade now is is now being seen in consumption in consumers and where things are going with this next generation of customers. And it's absolutely the fact that capitalism and business is one of the most powerful tools that humanity has ever developed to solve our problems. But it's equally true that there's glitches in the source code. You know, I started my career on Wall Street uh, representing shareholders, boards of directors, executive management, the fiduciary duties that come with those under the current source code. And Yet, I think what made us confident in tackling, EcoSpirits tackles a very simple problem. It's our cause, but it is the entire route to our profit and, our, is, and it's the problem of single use glass. The spirits and wine industry are entirely designed around the single use of a bottle of, of spirit or a glass bottle of wine. And EcoSpirits purpose, well, our cause, as John would put it, is ending single use glass in our industry. That's a simple concept, but it's a concept now that resonates deeply for the next generation of consumers. People are, are choosing differently what they consume, what they drink. They want the story behind it. They want to know who makes it. They want to know the provenance. They want to know the impact that their gin and tonic might be having on the environment. And they're willing to choose and consume a product that actually aligns with their values. And so as the consumer base is shifting worldwide, I think what made us confident to take on such a, a simple but compelling problem in an old industry was that we know the consumers are moving out ahead of where business is at. And a, a business and a technology like EcoSpirits that tackles a simple but pervasive problem like single use glass, if it's better aligned with where consumers are going now, as we see in the member base of 1880 and all across Asia Pacific, we have the opportunity to out compete the big players in our industry that have been around but doing it the same way um, for decades. So I think it's really where, where conscious consumption and the mindset of consumers is going that is giving business an opportunity to radically reshape how we eat, how we drink, how we travel, how we, how we consume. Here, if you could just add to that, how much resistance have you felt in, in trying to launch your product and, and, and sign up suppliers? Uh, in the EcoSpirits, EcoSpirits is all across Asia Pacific now. We're launching in, in the United Kingdom and France in the coming months. Um, the resistance has been limited. When you have a compelling you know, case that you're uh, tackling a, a fundamental problem that, that's impacting the planet, that's impacting landfill waste, impacting communities, um, it's been remarkable how quickly people have been ready to rethink uh, how something might arrive at their table or in their glass. Um, just like Josh is tackling with you know, cultured meat. It, why does it have to be the way? And if we sit and think about it now in, in this context of a shift towards conscious consumption and values-based consumption, um, we realize that there isn't really a reason or a need for it to be done that way. And so the reception to EcoSpirits in the two years since we launched, the willingness to change, the willingness to understand that things can be done differently um, has been remarkable. There's been far less resistance than we expected. I'm gonna go on my phone. Um, thanks, Josh. If um, if we take it back to the to the kids trying the product first, uh, how important is this time to your ability to succeed? In other words, could you have succeeded equally well 20 years ago? I um, your answer. I'm going to switch to my phone, by the way, as as suggested by by somebody. Uh, go for it, Josh. So I uh, I don't think even Mark, if we would have figured out a way to um, to receive the clearance and launch culture meet nine years ago, ten years ago, um, I think it would have flopped in Singapore. I think it would flop in the U.S. Um, there needs to be certain things that get people in a place where they can accept something like this. It's a pretty odd assumption. I mean, it's a pretty, um, it's a pretty common assumption to challenge. And if you think about it, it's somewhat strange that you can eat a, an animal, you can eat real meat without the killing of an animal. That's a lot to take in. And I, and I think, and I, what, what's, I think what's happened in the last, uh, looks like a, I, what's happened in the last five to 10 years is um, little by little, there's been a shift. 
And I think probably more than anything in the last year, a global pandemic, which is a zoonotic disease, which is a disease that jumps from an animal to a human because of shit that we do, not by accident, no one tripped over a vial, it's because of things we do, has opened up more eyes. Um, it has um, it is strengthened probably the point of view that was already in young people. Um, it has encouraged them to probably push their parents around a little bit more and ask them why are they doing it in this way. Um, and I think it's a remarkable time because of that. And I think we need to take advantage of it um, to in order to shift things. I mean, we need to shift things dramatically because um, in order to, to to get all this, you got to realize we don't have 50, 100 years to solve all of these urgent challenges. This is really a now thing that we got to get at it. And um, it's about technology. It's about regulation. But man, it's about mindset shift. And I think COVID and the way people have reacted to it, both in just hanging out with people and in real qualitative and quantitative data that we've taken a look at has initiated an important shift. People are more open to um, understanding that there's a glitch, not only in capitalism, there's a glitch in the system of how we do things. Um, and they wanna deal with that glitch. And dealing with it could mean they start a company like Paul right and dealing it with it because could mean they they notice john's book whereas maybe they wouldn't have thought about it before dealing with it could mean they order something different at a restaurant right um and i think that opens up opportunities to get to get more things done and uh and gives me more optimism about where we can go mark i will say i will say just one more thing to add to the to yeah. the uh, resistance piece to um, I made, I made uh, two assumptions when I started the company that turned out to be wrong. One is that existing industries don't get it, that the big agribusiness companies are made up of evil people who want to pollute our oceans, who want to destroy our rivers and could give two damn two shits about our bodies. That's what I thought in my head. Um, and um, I, I, and I didn't think we needed them. And what I realized later on um, after there was there were lots of campaigns against us in the early days is the individuals who make up these big companies. Um, when you remove the abstraction of the corporate logo are moms and dads with the same kind of kids who sat down at that first dinner at 1880. Um, and they're stuck in this system thinking that they need to do these things in order to make money and get more equity and get more raises. But when you open up a different path to them, right? when they get the premise of what John is is saying here, they'll do it. You just got to show them, right? That there's actually a way for them to make money, for them to get their shine, right? For them to get the recognition, for them to build the company while doing something a little bit different. And today, our best partners around the world are some of the biggest egg and meat and dairy companies, right? You wouldn't have expected it, um, you know, nine years ago, but that's reality today because a company is more than just that logo it's made up of human beings that are increasingly getting it and that's a really exciting thing okay so demand is well established and and i think that that's sort of where where we've come but what i want to understand a little bit is is where is supply and, and where is money um sabrina um i read about dinan um becoming b corp certified but also after a big acquisition the return on equity in there was was uh, was maybe lagging for a little while against some of the competitors, and yet um, and yet market share grew uh, because trust in the company seemed to be growing. But my first question relates to what happens to investors, and I understand that we're trying new ways of valuing companies. But at the end of the day, if you control a pension and you have an expectation on a return, you're going to put your money into safer bets. And if if a company is is maybe spending a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of resources on getting B Corp certified and living up to that um, when another company is making more, you know, uh, uh, difficult decisions and, and investing to, to grab market share or get higher returns. Where does that money flow? And, and um, so I'm going to start with Sabrina and John, I'm going to ask you to, to pipe in on this uh, um, right after, if you would. Yeah, um, yeah, that's that's a good question. And obviously, an important question when you're trying to when you're a single player um, trying to change the the discussion, right, or the paradigm. 
We're moving from this 1970s paradigm where it's not just economic theories, as John mentioned, like Milton Friedman, but entire legal systems, right? Like Delaware Supreme Court cases, entire financial systems that are built around the concepts of shareholder primacy. So it takes a lot of convincing, whether it's discussions at the, the business round table or having very vocal voices at BlackRock um, to say like, guys, to our point, there's a glitch in the system. It doesn't have to be this way. It's not mutually exclusive to do well and to do good. And actually, if you're um, you know, an investor managing fiduciary duties, it's in your interest to invest in companies that will bring sustainable profitability. We're not day traders, or those pension funds, right? Yeah. They're not day traders. They, they invest and they hold. And they, they are your staunchest critics for sure when you propose investment plans for ESG or, or C, CSR because they've been there. They've seen this. They've heard all of the greenwashing. They will challenge. Why are you spending not just management time, but energy and, and focus um, into this? And, and for us, we've, we have seen the value in our brands, right? There's B Corp for us is a trust mark. It's a way for us to better communicate to our consumers, our customers, whether they're retailers, right? Um, or our customers, the moms, the dads, the kids out there eating our products that you know, this is coming from a good place. It's not a product level certification. It's not like fair trade for coffee or organic for milk. It's certification on the entire business process. It's a very rigorous assessment on um, across five pillars of the business from community to workers to environment, uh, governance, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so I think on one point, I think our shareholders understand that is a level of investment. And of course, we are all learning uh, and growing through this process of rebalancing, right? We're moving from shareholder primacy to stakeholder primacy. We're not ignoring shareholders. That's, I mean, we're still you know, capitalists, but they are one of, of many stakeholders to be managed in day-to-day -day decision making. And I think fortunate for Danone, we've been able to point to very um, precise, uh, tangible uh, benefits for us as a company um, and for our shareholders. So an example um, I'm always proud to use on behalf of our team is that a few years ago, we were able to pull together um, uh, a 2 billion euro credit facility headed up or participated by 12 of the biggest banks in the world. I mean, you're talking about HSBC, Citibank, JP Morgan, SoftGen, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And this credit facility is directly tied to our sustainability, our verified ESG performance. So the greater, the, how the ratio works is that our margins on that cost of capital either decrease or increase based on the percentage of our sales that are covered by B Corp certification. So that for us is money, right? It, we, it, it, it directly connects the value of the business, the value of having a sustainable platform to the capital that we need to run the operations on a daily basis. So the interests are completely aligned. If I, if I can just question you, because I know some people will be asking and, and thinking, well, doesn't it on, on Evian and, and doesn't Evian produce a, an awful lot of single use plastic bottles? How, how do you respond to that criticism? I think it's fair criticism. I, I think we, we own up to it. We know that um, it's an important topic, not just for us, um, but also the food industry as a whole, uh, right? Uh, I think first, we staunchly believe that there's significant value in providing healthy hydration. The challenge, of course, is shifting from, again, this linear model and here we're talking about a linear model of packaging to a circular economy of packaging solutions. So this is what Paul is working on. And yeah. our responsibility as a big, big player in this is to use our scale and influence, to make sure that the right stakeholders are at the table, whether that's governments, NGOs, other companies, big and small, um, peers like Nestle or Coke and Pepsi and, and a whole host of startups that have an amazing technology 
uh, in this space to, to help bring solutions to the table. Um, you know, and so for us, it's been a journey for sure. Uh, we are, um, we have ambitions to have 100% of our packaging um, to be in the circular model by 2025. We're at about 80 or 90% today um, with significant investments uh, over the next three years to help accelerate that. Um, but it's all hands on deck, right? The, the issues of packaging or climate change or regenerative agriculture will require all of us um, and importantly, big players in, in the food industry. Fantastic, fantastic. John? I forgot what the question was. <laughs> Can you repeat it in very few words? I, I was just gonna let you pick up on anything that you, I was, I was gonna say whatever, whatever Sabrina, you know, sort of peaked in your mind, um, feel free to got comment it, on. It, um, it. Okay. It, it, so it was, couple, couple, so couple. anyway, I, I, I diverted a little bit with Sabrina, go for it. Okay. Couple of things on the on the plastic versus glass issue. This is this is my soda water. It's glass. We try not to let any plastic bottles into our apartment here in Hong Kong. Hong Kong's good at recycling glass, horrible at recycling plastic. When Paul gives me a solution for some better um, and more, better environmental, we we use in our home we use Brita whenever possible. I would say 99% of the water we drink is probably Brita. But Mark, to your, what you're saying earlier, I'm remembering now. I don't think doing there's two things. Number one, doing the right thing does not have to be expensive. Um, but when you do the right thing, it would only be an accountant, and I'm a former accountant myself, but it would only be an accountant who views doing the right thing as being something that is a one-off expense. Doing the right thing is an asset that you should capitalize. And it's an asset you can capitalize and you can, you can depreciate it over 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 years, because it's your brand. It's how consumers view you. It is how, how whether young people Young, talented young people want to come work for you. So doing the right thing is not a one-off expense. It is an investment in the brand and an investment in the company. Um, I think tied to that, um, sometimes doing the right thing can be a bit more expensive. Uh, probably many of you listened to the How I Built This podcast. And I listened to the, the founder of Chipotle when he wanted to go to all sustainable Neiman Ranch, whether we love Neiman Ranch or hate Neiman Ranch, they were early on in trying to be, make meat less cruelty-free. The price of the burrito increased by nearly a dollar, and he kind of panicked. Then he explained it to his customers, and the customers were like, "Yeah, okay, that makes that makes sense. Like I'm willing, like I as a consumer, I'm willing to pay a little bit extra." Um, in Hong Kong, I'll pay a little bit extra to take an electric taxi versus a, pe a petroleum belching taxi. I'm willing to do that as a consumer, but I think right now the good news is, in terms of building a great company, if you want to build a great company, three of the critical things you need are capital. Uh, great employees and customers willing to buy your product, like customers are willing to buy Josh's product. And I think right now we're in a sweet spot in all three of those areas. If you look at capital, for example, I had lunch with a friend of mine who's very senior. He's a 20 plus year partner at Goldman Sachs here in Hong Kong a few weeks ago. And he said, there's like this mountain of capital. He's like, we cannot find enough good investment opportunities in the ESG space. Like su supply of capital far, far, far exceeds really good investable companies like Josh's and like Paul's. Um, tied to that, when we raised our last round for Green Monday, you know, we thought we were gonna aim for 30, 35, 40 million dollars. We ended up turning people away after we got to 70, 71 million because so many people wanted to come in. And it's to what Josh's point of saying is we're, we're not just economic entities, we're people who wanna make a difference. We're people who wanna be able to look our kids in the eye. And as Chris Saka, from Shark Tank said, if you want to for the book, he's like, one day my daughters are going to say, mommy, daddy, we sure seem to have a lot of money. Where did that money come from? And he said, I want to be able to tell my kids it came from a good place. And I think with consumers, I, I, like consumers have very finely honed bullshit detectors yeah. these days. And so if a company says, oh, we're for purpose, um, my whole thing is in God we trust, all others bring data. Tell me how. And so yes, there's a lot of fake purpose out there, but when it's real, um, when it's real purpose, people know it and they embrace it and you're going to have very, very loyal customers. So I just think any business that doesn't get this at this point and isn't doing more, and there's obviously a lot of them out there. I mean, if I see one more advert or one more promotional piece, I mean, I, I passed a clothing store here in Hong Kong where I wanted to throw a brick through the window because they just this sign that said, we want to dress the people who change the world. And I'm like, 
what the fuck does that even mean? Like, don't, <laughs> don't, don't do fake purpose, do, do real purpose. So yeah. the good news is, just really quick, one final point. Yeah. The good news is that when a company is purpose-driven, they still have a competitive advantage because 90% of companies and 90% of leaders still don't get it. Those of us who are in the forefront of getting it have first mover advantage. Why is Microsoft Microsoft? Why is Facebook Facebook? All because of first mover advantage. So let's seize that if and when we can. Thanks very much, John. Josh, and, and ask you, I, I'm, I'm, you alluded a little bit uh, a while ago to some of the challenges that you faced early on. And I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, your business isn't something that you can start easily. It takes an awful lot of capital uh, to, to begin the R&D and come to market. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's really just how difficult and what were the biggest challenges going from this incredible vision that you had. And, and if you talk a little bit about that uh, to, to actually, you know, attracting investors. Yeah. Um... So yeah, this, this, I did, I did get it. Yeah. So, my, so this is the first, I didn't, I didn't get entrepreneurship growing up. My, I, my mom's a hairdresser, um, never understood that I could actually start a company, um, uh, growing up. Um, and in the, in the beginning, um, we, we, uh, were met with a, a ton of resistance from conventional, uh, industries, um, conventional animal protein companies, um, the, uh, some lobbying groups launched campaign against us. They paid bloggers to write negative stories about us. Uh, there was a lot of incoming. Uh, we even had a big CPG, <laughs> CPG company, Unilever, uh, file a lawsuit against us related to what we're naming an early product. Um, and I think you would see a lot, you're going to see some of that now, but you're definitely going to see a lot less of it. That same company, Unilever, has actually decided to stop suing companies like ours and instead make products that compete with ours, which I take is a is a really good sign of where the of where the world is headed. Um, I do want to say something about this whole Milton Friedman thing, and um, I didn't learn a lot from law school, but um, the little did the little that I that I did learn made me want to investigate Delaware law as it relates to thinking about expectations with investors because this is certainly one change today than when I started the company. You know, at least in terms of how, um, uh, how uh, judges interpret uh, the law in the US, it's about the long-term company interests. And shareholders, yes, are, are one element of a company, but there are lots of elements of representing the long-term interests of the company. And what we do now, Mark, that we didn't do in the early days is we're very direct with investors. And we've raised over $400 million we say to them, this is who we are. Um, our primary mission is to end the killing of an animal and the tearing down of trees through utilizing this technology and building a brand and getting consumers. Sometimes we're gonna make a decisions that seem aligned with um, your return. And sometimes we might not, but at the end of the day, know that our operating principle is increasing the probability that we solve this problem in the long term, believing that's how we're gonna build the kind of company that we all want. Some investors hear that and they say, I'm out. That's a little bit too much for me. More investors hear it. And just like John experienced with uh, Green Monday, who I'm a, um, a friend and partner and, and fan of, you end up being over allocated. There's something about setting that expectation. Everyone doesn't have to be in your camp. But when you're really clear about what you stand for, who you are, where the company is going, you end up getting people in your camp that really matter. And I think that's something that I've learned as a, as a first time CEO that setting those kinds of clear expectations are okay. You don't have to be concerned that uh, no one's going to like you if you talk with that kind of clarity, because the people that get it, you know, the Johns of the world, the Sabrina's of the world, the Paul's of the world, the Mark's of the world, they'll be attracted to it. And that's typically enough to build the kind of company that you need to, to really make this happen. Okay, John, you jumped from room to read to be on the board of Asia Partners, and, and now, congratulations, you guys are closing your, your final round. Uh, you're going to be deploying capital, and you're going to be assessing companies, uh, and ultimately, your shareholders are asking you to return uh, a certain bandwidth of, of ROI. But um, I gather your fund is, is taking um, a longer view, and that's why you're on the board. 
because you're someone who can assess the purposefulness of the companies you're going to invest in. Um, how does that how does that gel with the investors uh, in the fund? You know, so with Asia, so to, just to give a quick background, yeah. folks who don't know Asia Partners, Asia Partners is co-founded by a bunch of really smart guys, uh, and one of them, Nick Nash, was uh, uh, COO of, of C Group, which is now the most successful tech IPO in the history of Southeast Asia, 100 billion plus market cap. His co-founder Oliver Ripple had been at Naspers, did all four rounds of their investments in Flipkart, 21 billion dollar exit. Uh, to Walmart, most successful exit in the history of South Asia. So you have a couple of really smart guys coming together. And when I basically started talking to Nick about Asia Partners, he said, we, we, want, we want you to come on the board and we want you to be kind of our, social, our, our senior vice president of purpose. We want you to help us set a bold agenda for what are we going to do and how are we going to make sure that we're not just some private equity firm that is out there perpetuating the problems, um, repeating the error in the source code. And I would, I would say as a new fund, we're just about to close our final round, you know, inshallah, we should be closing it on, on Friday at hopefully, um, I can't say a number, but it's gonna be a nice number. Um, and what Nick and Oliver and the Brooke and the team when I came up with was number one, let's not invest in any company where we're gonna try to cost cut our way to glory. Let's invest only in companies where we see significant revenue growth opportunities, significant employment growth opportunities, significant economic or geographic expansion opportunities, so let's start with that. Let, let's, let's invest in companies to grow them. Let's, you can't cost cut your way to glory. Let's not be that kind of, you know, you mentioned Gordon Gecko. Let's not be that kind of PE firm. Number two, when they did their first investment in a, a lodging company, hotel company called Red Doors, um, they went to the team at Red Doors and said, congratulations. In addition to us investing 30 plus million in you, we're also funding 100 scholarships for young women in, in Vietnam through Room to Read. And that's our closing gift. Our closing gift is not a bunch of Lucite, uh, which by the way, I don't think those Lucite blocks are recyclable. Our closing gift is not a bunch of fruit baskets wrapped in plastic. Our closing gift literally is 100 girls in, Can in Vietnam will go to school. And we hope that when you do whatever, when you have a liquidity event, when you IPO, whatever you eventually do, we hope you'll pay that forward. We hope you do the same thing. And let's just make sure we, we, we set things up so when we do a transaction, there's a social benefit to the transaction. Um, and then third, it's the type of companies they invest in. So their second investment was in SnapAsk. Uh, SnapAsk is a really cool online tutoring company, makes tutoring much more efficient because rather than a, a college student or university student having to catch the MTR uh, to go do an in-person lesson, they can simply, the kid who needs lessons can simply hit a little uh, button on the app on their cell phone and get tutoring back and forth. So it's, it's gonna make the world, I think, smarter um, through online learning. So. I don't think there's really any silver bullet. I think there's a, a lot of little things that a firm can do along the way. But I think most importantly is the types of people we involve ourselves with. I know from both Nick and Oliver's history with Room to Read that when they make money, they tend to give it away, full stop. And that's how capitalism should work. We should run purpose-driven businesses. We should make money from them because without purpose, you don't have a business, you don't have sustainability. When we make money, we should do a good job of deploying it. Um, we should be um, Mackenzie Bezos. We shouldn't be Jeff. We should be Bill Gates. We shouldn't be Larry Ellison. E.G., <laughs> let's deploy it. Uh, great, well said. Um, I wanna just uh, invite anybody in the audience to uh, send questions on the chat um, to all of us, to the panelists. Um, there's one out there that I'm sure you can all see, which is which is sort of requesting that we don't live in la la land. And and I I generally like to have these evenings with with lots of debate and and uh, disagreement. But everybody here is so nice, and you all do such good work. None of you are going to disagree with 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 one another. But um, the question is uh, here from I want to see if uh, um, Dr. Cheryl Kim. Absolutely inspired, but um, is it, it uh, there's too much, the pitfalls to be aware of since many of us are idealistic in nature. What are the pitfalls to be aware of? And I'm, I'm gonna reveal that I think it's wonderful and it would be wonderful to do business with any of your companies, but yet we have done business in the past with companies led by people with less integrity or less interest in giving back. And, and I find that incredibly frustrating. And in a very competitive market, what I wonder 
is the danger of people undercutting the great achievements that you guys are, are, are doing. So for example, Paul, if I turn this question to you, very simply, um, the, uh, the cost differential of going with your product, EcoSpirits, um, may be perceived as being more expensive than going with the status quo. But in fact, it's not, is it? You know, I think the question is based on what Dr. Sherrill's put on the, the chat there about, you know, the pitfalls, correct? And, and um, the things to be aware of. Now, if you yeah. can just elaborate. Yeah, I'll pick up, Mark. I think I've got it. Sorry I'll, about the technology here right now. I'll, I'll pick up on Dr. Sherrill's point. And I think, you know, fundamentally, I'll, I'll make two quick points. One is that it is a wonderful time to be alive. And it's hard to say, you know, maybe strange to say that as we emerge from a pandemic here. But as, as John is saying, the intersection of the availability of capital, of consumers' interest, willingness to change, willingness to consider, you know, principles and, and solutions that might not have been of interest five or 10 years ago. But fundamentally, I, you know, two things that I would say, uh, you know, in response to the, the idealism of this area. One is your business fund has to fundamentally work. If you don't have a fundamental business that is offering value, that is solving a problem and that is saving your customers money or is helping them make money and is solving a business problem for them in a profitable way, you will never get uh, off the ground and up to a sustainable scale. And it's very important as, as people tackle these very compelling and inspiring problems that we all face in, in sort of sustainable world and economy, um, that fundamentally your business solution be sustainable uh, or profitable. I mean, Josh, you know, in, in solving the, the protein problem, you know, I had a conversation with an early employee at Impossible Foods uh, about the cow as a system of production and it being a 6% efficient machine. The, of the 100% of the inputs that go in, 6% comes back out as a uh, as a output in terms of consumable nutrition, um, that's a, that's a road to a profitable solution if if you can tackle it in the way you are. Um, so you have to have a fundamental strong value proposition on pure old fashioned business principles that can make money and help your customers succeed. Uh, and then the second, Cheryl, you know, my note of caution is it's a very noisy world right now. Um, as John said, there's an enormous level of capital interest in ESG and sustainable business solutions and innovation in food tech and elsewhere. Um, but that means there's also a lot of noise and distraction. I think it's very important that your purpose, you know, as John defines it as a company, your sustainability cr credentials be verified, be real, be, be credible. And it's very, very important that in, in a sector that's very of great interest where there's a lot of capital, um, that what you do from a sustainability perspective or a purpose perspective be credible and verifiable and 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 concrete. Mark, do you mind if I say something about the idealism part? Yes, please. And and then I also want you to answer the partnership question that Jackie has asked, uh, if you can see in the chat group there. Got it. Um, you know, I think I think all the things that you've you've heard about um, from from the panel, um, our objective truths about where consumers are going, about the needs that we face collectively as a, as a planet, that's all true. Um, what I also think is true that we should neglect is shit can be really hard and everyone doesn't get it. And every investor is not um, getting the kinds of things that we're talking about. Um, every mom's not getting it, right? Every regulator is not getting it. Um, there's still a large percentage of people out there that are living a different paradigm than the paradigm that's existing on this panel right now. Now, acknowledging that is not dismissing everything that we've just talked about over the last hour. But I believe both are true, right? What I just believe to be true a bit more is that the best way to deal with all of that hard stuff, and we've had a lot of hard stuff happen to us, um, is to put your head down and do good work and believe that perfect is not gonna happen today, but making things better is a really good thing. Um, and that's my form of idealism. It's not made up of, 
It's not made up of a ponies and firecrackers and ceremony, right? It's made up of a, of a hard grind every single day with people that get it, knowing that we're going to face all kinds of bullshit that we don't like, but the best way to deal with it is to deal with it. And the bet, right? The bet is that as we get on here, you're going to have a higher and higher percentage of people and regulators and investors and retail investors and name your constituency that gets it. And collectively, yeah. it's going to it's going to make it more likely to solve things. You know, as it relates to the the question that uh, the Jacqueline asked. So, our um, we have a business model that allows us to focus on technology and brand, but partner with some of the biggest egg meat dairy companies in the world to do some of the downstream distribution work. So, for example, in the United States, we partnered with the largest provider of chicken eggs to big fast food chains, hospitals, diners, your local restaurant. Um, they're a subsidiary of Post Holdings, um, and they have 700 people that knock on the door and sell conventional uh, chicken eggs, but those 700 people are now also selling an egg that comes from a plant. It's another product that we have. Um, so they make money <laughs> when they sell an egg that comes from a plant to your local diner. Um, and that's happening not solely because they care deeply about where sustainability needs to go, but because they want to make more money, right? And they want to be in the game and not and not and not and not out of the game. Um, so that's uh, that definitely gives me more optimism that the same drivers that can cause people to pollute are many of the yeah. same drivers that can cause people to invest in Paul's company, right? Meaning in the early days, maybe doing that, people saw profit. In today's world, they see investing in technologies like Paul is a more effective way to make more money. Thanks, Josh. Sabrina, as you are the only real true representative of big business, Sabrina. Yeah, I, I can hear you. I'm just reading through Rob's questions. So I, I can um, basically, what, what does it take to create this dramatic shift, um, especially since the, the roundtables announcement in 2019? Um, I mean, that, that was a good thing for sure, that announcement, but it's, that it was what it was, right? It was an announcement. Um, what needs to follow um, and still needs to follow is significant and meaningful action. And, and that unfortunately does not happen overnight. Um, and we're, we were one of the signatories along with B Lab um, to follow up the round table announcement very quickly with a letter back to those business leaders to say, okay, like walk the talk, right? Um, this is a framework, there is an existing framework that you can adopt or uh, find inspiration from um, to to really follow what you're trying to say. On so that's corporate behavior. Um, there's uh, Rob references um, public markets. I think uh, Josh had referenced this a little bit in a uh, previous uh, discussion point, but I, I think it's a little bit of a fallacy to to silo ourselves as as humans. Right, like we when I talk to our marketeers uh, within the company, and they start sil siloing people as like the millennial mom and the Gen Z whatever, and I'm like, no, like we're we're we're, we're one person, we're we're a holistic person, and in that regard, like as consumers or as investors, like deploy the money as you see fit, right, and that that will help with the drivers. You, you don't have this separate world of public markets, like you have pension funds, you have the investor communities that follow what we want uh, as you know participants in that system. So that's on the investor side, on the consumer side as well. Like we hope to be part of a movement that educates people on what they're buying and what they're eating. Where does it come from? How is it made? Who was involved? And, and hopefully that will be much more transparent over the, in the next, decade or so with, with technology, right? Um, and so that's another way that we can help accelerate this dramatic shift that is needed. Um, because as we said before, we don't have that much time. Um, do you want me to cover Jacqueline's next question? I think it's right under Rob's. <laughs> Might as well. Um, yes. So yes. Jackie asked, uh, okay, so similarly, is there a lot of M&A happening? Yeah, I mean, definitely to Josh's point, like 
it's this is not either or. This is not mutually exclusive. We're we're not in that world, right? And and Danone, we um, we believe in that staunchly as well. Um, I was in Danone, Paris, to work on um, our last major acquisition about four years ago. Um, it was about a 12 billion euro acquisition of White Wave, which is primarily an organic and plant-based company. And folks who were um, maybe in the industry were shocked because what do people know Danone for? Yogurt, for dairy, right? And imagine like we have thousands of farmers all around the world and they were like, you just doubled your dairy or essential dairy plant-based business overnight. Um, in the US, it doubled, like from 3 billion to 6 billion in top line, right? And so you can imagine the work, the communication that was needed to help manage that constituency. And so for us, this is truly something that we deal with every day is like, how do we, we're still providing dairy based products, but we are also working with innovators internally and externally, like Josh's company to bring the, the plant base or the technology forward analogs, right? And, and we need all of these solutions on the table for sure. It, we, if we were an ideal world, none of us would ever touch any amount of plastic. None of us would ever eat any meat, right? But it's the transition. And I think we have to be pragmatic and, and maybe that's the, the jaded corporate side of me, right? Because I've, I've seen the steps that are needed. I've seen, the discussions that you do, do need to have at the table with the investors, with the pension funds, with, with the banks um, and your own shareholders, that these are, these are incremental changes, significant incremental changes that are needed. Okay, thanks. I, I wanna get all these questions answered. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna parcel them out um, individually. Um, and I'm, I'm particularly interested in Ian's question on what problems would, um, in your world would AI solve? Because tomorrow I'm hosting a panel on AI and ethics. Um, so I'm gonna throw that question um, actually at Josh because I think you have the biggest operation uh, in play right now. Um, and while you're answering that, uh, I'm going to ask, um, Eliezer Ong has asked uh, what COVID has done and how maybe the one lesson or insight that you've learned uh, and, and maybe you can uh, extrapolate that on and add whether there is a seismic shift or just a temporary shift. Um, and, and maybe Paul, because you work in a, in a public domain, I mean, in a, you know, direct consumers, you could take that question on. Um, and then finally, well, why don't we start with those two and, and then we'll, we'll see where we get to. Um, and John, I gather you have to leave in 10 minutes. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I've got to. So, I've got to get a dinner. It uh, started at eight thirty, and it, I've got to make sure by nine o'clock to be half an hour late, acceptably late. So, very apologies. Canadian of you. Um, yeah. So, um, one, I want to. I want you to leave with one very insightful answer. Um, so maybe you can pick which question you'd like to to end with. Okay. I'll keep. I'll keep it brief because I. I, I definitely want to make sure John has a has a chance to leave us with a closing thought. I will say quickly, Sabrina, I think what Danone did in that acquisition, when people are writing about why the food system has changed 20, 40, 50 years from now, they're gonna mention that as an important inflection point because it, it showed entrepreneurs who might not have been thinking that there's real money in alternative proteins that there is. It showed investment bankers there's real money in it, right? And it, um, it was before, alternative protein feels in like it feels today, right? Um, and I think it's an example of a set of things that then create the conditions to make this happen. Now, in terms of AI, um, you know, I'll, I'll start with the food system just as an example of a way to think about approaching AI. So the food system, this big system that affects our lives, there are a lot of issues in food. A billion people go to bed hungry every single day. So why do a billion people go to, hunger, hung, be, go to bed hungry every single day? We feed more food to the animals we eat than the billion people um, that are dealing with that. That's not because we don't have plentiful food and because it's re, it, we make it challenging to get food to people. So think about how artificial intelligence could help sort of map the flows of food and could give companies important information about how to change those flows in a way to potentially make it profitable for them to serve more people. 2.1 billion people 
suffer from micronutrient deficiency. This is not about starvation. This is about not getting enough nutrients to allow their brain to develop. There are a lot of companies, uh, Nestle, Danone, et cetera, that are incorporating micronutrients into more of their food products to solve that problem. Maybe they're actually more optimal combination of micronutrients that end up being uh, more potent in solving these problems. How can data-driven um, uh, nutritional uh, data sets, how can artificial intelligence help these companies understand how to better mix and match micronutrients in order to optimize for human health? In our world, there are 390,000 species of plants all over the planet. Less than 1% are used um, for how to make food better. That's crazy. Why don't we map the functionalities of plants in a more effective way? And we could use artificial intelligence to do that. So it's an example of driving into a system, whether you're talking about communications or transportation or food or education, and unpacking and asking yourselves, how does a data-driven approach um, allow you to solve these particular problems more effectively? Last thing that I would say, there are too many damn problems in the world for you not to use AI to solve real problems. And know the difference again between the whatever problem and problems of real urgency. You don't need to ask your friends about it. You'll, you, you know it. Um, and that, that's a good way, I think a good methodology to, to, go, to go about attacking it. Thanks for that, Josh. John, quick word from you before you run off for dinner. Yeah, so I'm gonna just grab Hans. Hans Brower asked a question and said, what would, uh, what would motivate a CEO to embrace purpose and to embrace the value of acting on behalf of the planet, not just profit? And I hope this isn't hokey, but I'm gonna actually just read two short paragraphs from my book, uh, the final chapter, which is titled The Ultimate X Factor, because I think this answers it. This is the final chapter of the book and I wrote, the majority of this book has tried to make a case for business to integrate a sense of purpose into their DNA. I close by positing there's even more, an, an even more important reason for purpose. Why owe you? You. You count. You matter. You get a vote. You, in fact, get the deciding vote. The only person who ultimately owns your career choice is you. Not your boss, not your board, not those skeptical Debbie Downers who might try to talk you out of it. And the great news for you and for the world is that there are more choices and opportunities out there than ever before. You get to decide whether you're going to embrace business as usual and have work remain a four letter word, or if instead you will join the migration and use the power of capitalism to be a force for good in our world. And I believe that if you take on that challenge or dial it up even further compared to what you're, compared to what you're already doing, the ultimate beneficiaries will not just be your business and society, but also you and your family. I close with, a conversation I had with my executive coach, a great Canadian named Jeff Balin, who's out of Vancouver, fellow Kellogg grad, former fellow Microsoft alum who now does executive coaching full time. He devotes 40% of his time to pro bono coaching for social entrepreneurs. So he's built purpose into his model. Jeff has studied Judaism greatly uh, and deeply. He studied Buddhism very deeply. And I once said to him, Jeff, is there a secret to life? And he said, there's not really a secret. He said, maybe it's simpler than people realize. It's very, and he said, I think of it this way. I tell people, figure out what you wanna say in your deathbed and work backwards from there. Think about what you wanna say on your last day on earth to your grandchildren, or your great grandchildren and work backwards from there. And if what you're doing today is in alignment with what you wanna say on your last day on earth, then good on you, mate. Don't stress about it. Just keep on keeping on. If what you want to say is not in alignment with what you're currently doing, you got to realize life moves quickly. You're going to be old before you know it. You got to start to move that battleship in that direction. And so I would appeal to any CEO, not by their title, I'd appeal to them as, as a human being, as Josh mentioned. Just appeal as a human being to say, you want to be able to say at the end of your life, you were here for good, that fewer trees were cut down, fewer animals were slaughtered. Um, you know, less carbon was emitted uh, to produce our libations, whatever it might be. I think ultimately the reason to do it, there are numerous, numerous, numerous business benefits from recruiting to retention, to relationships with regulators, to social, how you look on social media. But the ultimate reason is very simple. What do we want to say we're doing with our lives? Do we want to go to work with a spring in our step and a, a smile on our face? Or do we just want to like go in and just spend one more day working for the man? Uh, nobody ever put on their tombstone, she cranked out 28 consecutive quarters of increasing earnings per share 
for her employer. So that's how I would, that's how I would answer the question. And thank you, Hans, it was a great question. Uh, John, uh, as always, thanks so much uh, for bringing your wisdom to, to 1880 and to the panel. Um, we hope to see you very soon and I'll give you a call tomorrow. Um, we will also be host, posting the link to this um, that you can share with people that, that couldn't make it. But John, for now, thanks very much for being here. Yeah, I apologize for the first to dessert, but I got dinner waiting, so. Okay. Bye, Off everybody. Cheers, John. Um, I did want to answer the COVID question, Paul, if, if you've had some time to ponder that. And then I think Sabrina, Josh, and, and Paul, um, all of you might want to take a crack at uh, Anurag's question, which is, you know, really coming to the point of um, the willingness of the consumer to pay a premium um, to do good, if you like. Okay, so Paul, you first on the subject of COVID. Yeah, on the COVID front, um, the laser hanging, um, I, I work in an industry that has suffered not a one in a hundred year event over the last year. It's probably been a one or three or four or 500 year event. The bar, restaurant, hotel industry, you go back to the pandemic in 1918, wasn't as deeply affected as it was in this crisis. The lockdown response, sort of the forceful government response to shut down hospitality in the United Kingdom for months on end, you know, for hotel industry to be closed for months, for worldwide to have such a large percentage of restaurants and bars not even able to operate, whether in California or Finland or London. Um, this has been an incredible shock for our industry. And so I think I, you know, I, I do like taking this question because I, what we've lived through as a hospitality industry, and Mark knows it in, in operating 1880 as a hospitality business as well, is it's been a, not just a once in one's career test or a once in a hundred year test. It, it's been so far beyond the data set, beyond the planning set, beyond the experience set the industry was ready for um, that it's brought tremendous insight. And I think now, you know, we're engaged from Finland to India, to California, to mainland China, to Australia with partners on the ground in the bar, restaurant, hotel industry, large and small, who almost without exception, are preparing for the recovery with energy, with a sense of pause that this has given, with a hope that and a belief that the hospital industry will come back, that it will come back stronger, that it's resilient. And I think the biggest insight I've taken away from the whole experience, um, other than hoping that this once in 500 year event doesn't return in my career in the industry, uh, is that sense of resilience. It's been incredible to see how resilient an industry can be that is so under the spotlight of a crisis like this. And, you know, our, our partners in London, they were not even opening really in full until June based on the reopening plan that Boris just released, um, are hopeful. They're preparing for the recovery. They're already investing in innovation, willing to reconsider sustainability in a way they didn't before the pandemic. So my hope is the great lesson we all take out of this is a sense of our own resilience our company's resilience, our industry's resilience, and our society's um, ability to persevere through difficulty and rebound not just alive, but stronger. And, and I, that's often what I say to our team and, and our partners from our experience, um, looking at the industry worldwide with this. Thanks for that answer. And thanks, uh, Laser, for that question. So um, Sabrina and Josh, Anarek's question, there's, there's another side to it, which is, you know, does it create a, a separation of, of the haves and have nots? Josh, you've spoken in previous articles about your upbringing, living on food stamps and, and, and generally, you know, being able to afford really shitty food, nachos and, and, and fast food and, and cafeteria nonsense. And, yep. and, and, and what does that mean for the consumer as we start to introduce more products that are healthier and better for the environment and what have you, but who, who let's say, haven't achieved the scale and, and whose cost point is gonna be a little bit higher and therefore unattainable for the majority of, of families living, you know, closer to, to uh, let's say, you know, on, on a marginalized. Um, yeah. and, and, uh, and Josh, if you can take that one on and Sabrina, same question to you in terms of product development with the Dinon is, I mean, I know about your, your, your partnership with Grameen in Bangladesh and, and all the incredible work that you do there. Um, but there is, a, there is a purpose to feed the world and to feed the world in a healthy way. And, and what are the premiums that people might be willing to pay? So anyway, the person who's asking this question, if anybody should have data, it's him. 
I'm very, I'm sure he's really keen to hear your answers. <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, so Mark, you're right. I, I grew up, uh, those nachos were uh, nacho and cheese from 7-Eleven. And um, I, for much of my life, I, I grew up on food stamps. Um, you know, much of the income was coming from my mom's work as a hairdresser. And when you grow up in Birmingham, Alabama in the 80s, and that's the money you have, you end up eating a lot of shitty food. And, um, you know, the way, the way that we think about it is that, um, ultimately to solve this problem you got to figure out a way to reach kids like me um if you're only serving people who have um a lot of extra money to spend you might be able to build a really profitable and good long-term company but you're not going to solve the long-term systemic problem and we think it's about sequencing you know you know the reality is state cultured meat um until Singapore gave the clearance and we had an opportunity to launch with you and the team, Mark, not a single person had sold a single ounce or pound anywhere in the world. And through selling something, you're making more of it. And through making more of it, you're able to reduce the cost of it. And through reducing the cost of it, you're able to ensure that it's available to more and more people. So what can seem, I think, sometimes as contradictory in nature, right? We believe deeply that everyone should have the access, literally everyone, to this kind of meat without all the issues. Yet um, today uh, at 1880, um, it's not exactly available for uh, kids like me on food stamps growing up in Alabama, as an example, right? Um, but um, again, it's the, the nature of how economics now product introduction starts. You've got to start with a group. You get, um, you build a relationship, you're able to make more and ultimately that cost comes down. Um, and that's how we see things. Again, this is, is not about literally solving all the problems today, but what, we can, what can we do together with partners to increase the likelihood that we'll be able to solve it tomorrow in five and 10 years from now? My, my, the mission I think a lot about, uh, Mark, is my niece. She's two years old. By the time she gets into high school, her name is June. I want the vast majority of uh, chicken, beef, pork, eggs, milk, that she's eating in her school that is being consumed around the world, not to require killing a single animal, not to require bulldozing down a single tree. Um, but that's got to start in a place. Um, and then and then you move on from there. Um, just the last thing I'll say, and Sabrina, um, sorry for being long winded. I, I want to hear your response to this. One of the most important reasons for me personally, why doing this work matters has nothing to to necessarily do with the impact it's having out there, although that, that's a primary driver. Personally, I want to be happy. Selfishly, I want to be happy. Um, and the, the, the science of, um, of, of happiness um, really does indicate that focusing on things that are larger than your cells, problems outside your cells, increases, increases the likelihood that you personally will be happy. Um, and I, I often think that's, that's missed in conversations about why it's good to focus on good things because we can make a lot of money. There's also about motivating individuals to do it. And I know just from my own life, um, I'm just happier during, during the day knowing that I'm not full of a whole bunch of cognitive dissonance that what I deeply believe is also yeah. what I'm acting on. Yeah, fantastic. Extremely well said. Uh, Sabrina, over to you. And um, I, I see that Varun has thrown up some statistics there, but, but, but maybe just go to sort of your corporate jobs point of view, um, if you can. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I think uh, you wanted to hear about uh, Grameen, um, but I think also to our, before I get into our partnership with Grameen in Bangladesh, going into um, his question about costs and pricing, um, I think that two, two quick points. First, um, I don't think doing the right thing necessarily increases costs um, and therefore increasing price. Um, I think there's a couple of good examples of that. Uh, one is EcoSpirit. So on my, my personal life side, um, all the dinner conversations I've had with Paul on the work the team is doing there, that, that is an amazing 
example of a business that is doing things better and actually more cost efficient than the traditional model. And in my world, um, we could say the same about regenerative agriculture, right? So when we inform or we teach our farmer partners on how to farm better, they become more efficient, they have better yields. So that brings down prices that doesn't require us to pass on the costs. Um, and my second point to cost before I, I move on to Grameen is that I think we've probably worked, um, unfortunately, on a false premise on what exactly is cost. We've, we've lived in this model where costs have always been um, externalized, right? Like there's a reason why in the US you don't have maternity leave. There, there's a reason why a lot of companies don't have proper health insurance, right? Because they've been able to get away with it. Um, so companies like Danone um, are trying really hard to internalize those costs that over time have been externalized um, and also trying to put a number to it, right? So for us, we've been working with a lot of um, folks in the financial sector um, in, in redefining meaningful metrics. So carbon adjusted EPS is an example, right? So we will put the information out there. We will figure out a way um, to hold ourselves accountable and, and do our part um, in, in this ecosystem of uh, responsible businesses. Um, so I'm grooming. Um, super happy to, to at least end, end on that uh, for my note because it, it's a very, very special project for me personally. Um, I've been working with the team for the last five to seven years. Uh, it's a joint venture that's been created um, about 15, 16 years ago, of course, uh, between Danone and Mohamed Yunus, uh, who founded the microcredit bank and then uh, later uh, was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, that partnership's mission is very simple, right? Um, similar to Josh's point, it was to fight malnutrition and, and to create a positive social impact in the local community throughout its entire value chain. So again, moving from this notion of externalizing costs to appreciating um, interdependencies. So um, on a very pragmatic level, uh, on the product itself, uh, the company's yogurts are designed to deliver kids with at least 30% of their daily requirement for key micronutrients. So uh, stuff like iron or zinc or vitamin A in, in a little like yogurt package, right? Um, and we also, together with Grameen, uh, focused on the value chain. So upstream, downstream, whether it's on the supply side, making sure that all of our milk and ingredients are, of course, purchased from um, small local farmers, but also applying our know-how as a big company um, around the world. And again, teaching the local community on the farming practices, on regenerative agriculture, on these topics that seem so Western, right, or so advanced. Um, there's lots of ways to cross-pollinate there. And on the distribution side, of course, is doing our part to ensure that there's an inclusive growth economy. So having um, uh, work that provides women uh, with empowerment and, and having their own real retail shops and selling our products amongst others. Um, so that's, uh, you know, definitely something from a selfish perspective, it brings joy and meaning to, to my work uh, on a daily basis. There's many, many examples of Grameen's, uh, Grameen partnerships all around the world, right? Um, but, but that one really uh, hits home because you know I, I went there, I met our farmers, I met the kids, went to the plant, met the factory workers. Um, and I, I really hope everyone here has the opportunity to follow something like that. I, I really don't think... Okay. <clears throat> so there's a little bit of feedback coming. Yeah. Um, hopefully that's not going to happen again. Uh, hopefully you can all hear me. But um, there's probably not a better note to end off than, than Mohammed Yunus and this incredible partnership um, between the two organizations. Um, so I, I really want to want ask to everybody ask out there, while the internet is still working here, uh, to join me in thanking the panelists because you guys have all been exceptional. Um, to Sabrina and Josh, um, thank you so much for waking up at 5.30, Sabrina, and Josh for staying up so late. I know it's about three o'clock in the morning there now. 
uh, and and Paul, I, I know it's late for you. Uh, you're usually running a marathon at this point. Um, <laughs> uh, and to everybody out there, um, thank you so much for being here. Um, it's it's so much harder to understand the, to get the vibe of the room without all of you in our you know in, in close proximity. But um, for me, if I again to Josh's point, just on a very selfish note, this has been an incredibly rewarding. Uh, conversation and, and full of amazing insights. So uh, to one and all, thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you at the next one. All the best. Thank Thanks, you, everyone. guys. Thank thank you, thank you. Thanks for giving us the space to talk about this, Mark, and everyone at the Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Thanks, you.